give a, a warm welcome to my friend Matt in just a moment. Um, Matt is going to share some, oh, this time kids, kids can slip out, and instead of going to this hallway, go to the prayer chapel, because they have a project for you in the prayer chapel. So you go that direction, someone's back there pointing you the right way. Um, Matt is going to share some scripture with us, uh, so we're going to look in and see what the Bible says about immigrants. He's also going to just share some information, just some factual information that helps us understand the difference between immigrants and refugees. It's going to be an educational time. This is also a really relevant topic for us as a church. Estimates are somewhere between five and 7,000 Haitian uh, immigrants and refugees have shown up in Springfield in the last uh, several months. So this is an issue that touches home, and Matt is a, has a reputation nationally in addressing this issue and helping Christians think about it, and he's just my good friend. Uh, so let's give Matt a warm welcome to Central. Well, it is wonderful to be with you all, and, and great to see Carl again. We've known each other for a, quite a long time now, and we've talked about uh, me trying to get here to Central for a number of times over the years, and I'm glad this has worked out. Uh, my, my day job, I work at an organization called World Relief, uh, which is a global Christian humanitarian organization. We work in various locations all around the world, and really since we were uh, started in the 1940s, we've been focused on, on two things. One is displacement, people who've been forced to leave their homes, and also the church. Our mission is to empower the local church to serve the most vulnerable. Uh, so we started actually in response to the displacement that happened in Europe after World War II, when there were churches in the United States that wanted to come alongside churches in Europe to help to rebuild and to care for those who'd had to flee their homes. And then fast forward a few decades, uh, there was a, a missionary couple, uh, Grady and Evelyn Mangum, who'd served for many years in Vietnam, and then were back in the United States when Saigon fell, and they began to receive telephone calls and telegrams and letters from some of the people whom they had worked with in Vietnam who basically were, had had to flee and were at risk and asked this couple, is there anything you can do to help us find safety? So this couple basically started knocking on every door of every church that had ever supported them as missionaries uh, in Vietnam and said, hey, could you take in a family, help support them, help them to get on their feet in the United States? And also, of course, you, uh, you know, an individual or a church doesn't have the authority to decide who comes to the United States. So they were knocking on the door of the U.S. government and saying, hey, can you make sure that more of these people can get to safety? Many of whom were at risk because of their association with the United States during the war in Vietnam. And over time, they, uh, they ran out of churches in their own denomination, and they uh, came to World Relief and said, could you help us do this with more churches? And th so that program became World Relief Refugee Resettlement Program in 1979, and since then we've worked with churches in various parts of the United States to resettle about 300,000 refugees into communities across the United States. So we're really passionate about this issue of refugees and about larger issues of immigration, but again, our mission isn't just to resettle refugees or to help immigrants integrate into communities, it's to empower the local church to serve the most vulnerable. But I don't have to tell you all that, in, especially in the last few years, this issue of refugees and immigration have actually become really controversial topics in our society as a whole and, and in local churches as well. Uh, so recently we were really trying to understand how are, how are people who profess to follow Jesus thinking about issues of immigration. And we worked with a, a polling firm called Lifeway Research to, un, to do a poll where they asked uh, self-identified evangelical Christians in the United States what was the most important factor influencing their views on the arrival of immigrants to their community? And there's some interesting things in that poll, but probably the most disturbing to me was that only 20% of evangelical Christians said that the Bible was the most important factor influencing their view on the arrival of immigrants to their community. Uh, in fact, when we were first working on preparing that polling question, the folks at Lifeway warned me, you know, if you ask evangelical Christians any question and the Bible is one of the choices, they know that that's the right answer. Whether it's totally honest or not, they're probably going to check that box because they know that you know, the Bible is sort of what's supposed to be our guide. But still, only about one in five came up with the Bible as what was most influencing their views on this particular topic. In fact, it came in well below the media. So often we've thought about this issue from the perspective of CNN or 
at Fox News or MSNBC or something we saw on Facebook or Twitter or the local newspaper, but too rarely have we looked at what does the Bible say that would inform how we think about this complicated issue that's affecting our world and, and affecting a community like Springfield. So that's what I want to do this morning is just look at some of the big themes biblically that we believe ought to be informing how we think about this topic. And I'll, I'll start with this. As followers of Jesus, we are followers of a refugee. Or maybe an asylum seeker. I will mo note the, the U.S. legal distinction in a moment. But the picture you can see there is my daughter Zipporah, a few years back, um, in the month of December when she just decided that her favorite toy was our nativity set. Uh, many of you probably have a nativity set that you bring out around Christmas time. And we had read her the, the Christmas story from the Jesus Storybook Bible enough that she knew the story quite well, and she could act it out, and she knew why there was shepherds and wise men and uh, cute little animals in the stable and Mary and Joseph and Jesus. But she turned to me one day and said, Dad, this nativity set is missing someone. We don't have the angry king. And I thought about that. Um, how many of you have a nativity set with a King Herod figurine? It's maybe not our favorite part of that story, right? It's actually a little bit unpleasant to end your Christmas celebration with this jealous, tyrannical, angry king coming to kill all the little boys in Bethlehem. But that is part of the story. In Matthew chapter 2, in fact, as soon as the Magi, the wise men, are on their way back to their country, Joseph is warned in a dream that Herod is coming to kill all the boys in Bethlehem, and Joseph is told to get up in the middle of the night, no time to make a plan, and to flee, to escape across the border into Egypt, where they would be outside of Herod's authority, and they would be safe. And in that sense, Jesus was a refugee, or at least something very close to what we now call a refugee. Of course, they didn't have a formal legal definition or a legal process to go through, as far as we know, when this happened to Jesus and his parents. Uh, we do have those legal definitions now, and I think it is helpful just to understand some of that terminology. So we hear about immigrants. Those are just people who've left one country to go reside in another. A refugee is a subset of, an Im of immigrants who are specifically defined by why they left. Under both U.S. and international law, a refugee is someone who's out, who has fled their country because of a well-founded fear of persecution that is specifically based on their race, religion, political opinion, national origin, or social group. Uh, and the best estimates are globally there's about 31 million refugees in our world today. It's a higher number than since anyone has been tracking these numbers. Uh, the other category that you hear about in the news often, and especially recently, is asylum seekers. Uh, the easiest way to understand asylum seekers are these are people who, when they first show up in a country that they hope to be refugees in, they claim to be a refugee. They profess that they have a credible fear of persecution for one of those reasons. Uh, but our government and other governments around the world don't necessarily just take your word for that. Until they have the opportunity to verify the details of your specific situation, they're not going to call you a refugee. They'll call you an asylum seeker. And so, of course, if you go back to Jesus' story, we don't know exactly how, if at all, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph interacted with the Egyptian authorities and, uh, at, at the border, if there was any sort of interaction there. We don't know if they had to prove that they had a good reason to need to flee to Egypt. But what we do know is that for roughly 100 million people around our world today who are either refugees or asylum seekers or internally displaced, meaning they've fled their homes but still within the boundaries of their country, they have someone in Jesus who can very personally identify with that story. Because that was something that, as a small child, he himself lived. And that is a, a, in a sense, gives solace to a great number of people around our world who have, have lived this really awful situation of having to flee their homes. Because they know that Jesus himself had that same experience. Another core biblical theme that I believe ought to inform how we think about uh, this and a great number of other issues is that it, we believe as Christians that every human person is made in the image of God. And we get that in Genesis chapter 1, the first, first chapter of the Bible, where we see that God creates both man and woman in his image. And Christians have historically understood that to mean that, that human beings are made in the image of God means that they have value. That human life is precious, that it's worth protecting, regardless of any qualifier. Your ethnicity, your country of origin, your language, your religion. If you're a human person, your life is valuable and worth protecting. And that fundamentally would give us an, a strong motivation to do whatever we reasonably could to want to protect someone who's fleeing the threat of persecution or even death. But then there's another dynamic being made in the image of God that I think is relevant as we think about 
uh, the arrival of immigrants to a community, and that is that if immigrants are people, which they are, and are made in the image of God, which they are, they also have potential. Because they are made in the image of a creator, with the potential to create and to contribute, just like every one of us. Uh, sometimes I think we forget that dynamic because very often in this country and in many parts of the world, when we think about immigrants, very quickly the conversation goes to, what is this going to cost us? What are those people going to take? How many jobs will they take? Those are fair questions, but frankly, they're only fair questions if we are concurrently asking, how many jobs are they going to create? And the answer is probably a lot, at least historically speaking. About 44% of uh, Fortune 500 companies in this country were founded or co-founded by an immigrant or their child. So all sorts of jobs in this country wouldn't exist, or at least wouldn't be, exist in this country, if it wasn't for our country's legacy of immigration. And that doesn't even into, take into account small businesses, which is actually a much larger part of our economy. Or even on a fiscal level, it, some people would appropriately be concerned at a time when a lot of families' budgets are, are stretched really tight, can our government afford to be using taxpayer money to help people from other countries? Uh, but the reality is, uh, because those are people made in the image of God, they're also going to contribute to that tax base. So, um, for example, if you look at the average refugee, and again, these are specifically a subgroup of immigrants who were selected by our government because they fled persecution in their countries of origin, and they get some help from the U.S. government when they first arrive. And if you looked at the average refugee, let's say two years after they'd arrived, most of the time they're going to have received more from the American taxpayer than they have paid in. The same is true of my two-year-old son, Zacchaeus. Uh, he's a drain on the economy. Uh, he has not worked a day in his life. But that's a little bit silly, right? Like, you don't look at one snapshot in time. You would look over a horizon of time. And it turns out if you do the same with refugees, you find the same thing. Uh, a couple of economists at Notre Dame did a study a few years back and found that 20 years after arrival, the average refugee adult has contributed $21,000 more in taxes at all levels than the combined cost of governmental expenditures on their behalf. So it's actually a net fiscal benefit to the United States in the long term. Uh, and in fact, economists who've looked at this have found that that's generally true as you look at the economic impact of immigrants of all backgrounds, not just those who come as refugees. Yes, there are costs, but also there are, are contributions. Now, to be really clear, at, at World Relief, we don't resettle refugees primarily because we think it's in our economic interest. We do so because we think that their lives are valuable, made in the image of God, and worth protecting. Uh, but it is precisely because they are made in the image of God that we should not at all be surprised that they have that potential to create and to contribute and that uh, over time immigrants have done so in really remarkable ways. Another really core biblical theme in, is that God has this particular concern for those who are vulnerable. And this comes through especially in the Old Testament where there are, are three categories of people who are mentioned repeatedly in the same passages over and over and over again. It's the orphan, the widow, and the foreigner. Or depending upon which translation of the Bible you're reading in English, that word for foreigner, you might see sojourner, stranger, alien, immigrant. The Hebrew word there is the word ger, and that word alone appears 92 times just in the Old Testament. It's actually a very frequent theme. And sometimes just in a descriptive sense, God describing, the authors of the Old Testament describing individuals one, from one country who've gone to reside in another. Uh, but also with some uh, commands of God to his people about how to treat those people. Uh, we heard one of those in the, the scripture reading from Deuteronomy 10 this morning. God basically says, I love these vulnerable categories of people, and you shall love them as well. And that command to love wasn't just a generic command. It also had some specific legal ramifications. Uh, in, in Deuteronomy 24, God tells his people, when you go through your crops, your olives, your wheat, your grapes, you should go through everything one time and leave what remains for the orphan, the widow, and the foreigner which was actually a really ingenious system. It wasn't just a handout system. There was still some work to be done, but it was a means by which these vulnerable categories of people who were unlikely to be landowners in an agrarian society where your ability to feed yourself was tied to having land could still meet that most basic need. And I'm not suggesting that, you know what we need in the United States is a gleaning law. We should really get Congress to pass Deuteronomy 24 into effect. Uh, I don't think that, that would necessarily solve our immigration challenges, but I do think that a principle is there for those of us who are Christians, which is that, that the unchanging character of God is a concern for those who are vulnerable. And that can affect how we think even about public policies. 
Now, another core biblical principle, and it also comes from the Old Testament, but is then uh, repeated several times in the New Testament, is the command to love our neighbors as ourselves. In fact, that occurs in Leviticus 19, verse 18. God tells the people of Israel, love your neighbor as yourself. A few verses later, in verses 33 and 34, he says, when foreigners reside with you in your land, you shall not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you shall be to you as your native born. You shall love them as yourselves. So even from that one chapter in Leviticus, we could conclude that this command to love has some very broad ramifications. But then in the Gospels, Jesus makes this more, even more clear. He's asked at one point, well, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus affirms that it's to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. But the, the legal scholar, the lawyer who's asking him this question isn't going to let that stop there because he wants to justify himself. He wants to prove that he's met this requirement of the law. So he asks Jesus uh, the follow-up question of, well, who is my neighbor? And you get the sense that he would prefer a very precise legal definition. Your neighbor is someone uh, three doors down on either side as long as they're of the same language and ethnicity and religion as you. But that's not how Jesus responds. Jesus responds instead with a story. It's what we think of as the parable of the Good Samaritan, um, which many of us are very familiar with. There's this presumably Jewish person beaten, robbed, and left to die on the side of the road to Jericho. And a, a priest and a Levite, the religious leaders of the time, come by, see him in need, but pass by on the other side. And then a Samaritan, someone who have a different ethnicity, a different religious tradition, not just different, but uh, disliked by most people who would be hearing this story, comes along sees him in need and has compassion on him and stops and takes him to get help. Jesus asks the, this legal scholar, okay, which of these three was a neighbor to a man who was in need? And of course, it's the Samaritan, and Jesus says, well, go and do likewise. And I think one obvious takeaway for us is that that neighbor whom we're called to love uh, could be just about anyone, but certainly a vulnerable traveler of a different ethnicity or religious tradition. That is exactly the example that Jesus provided us. Another takeaway from that story as we think about issues of immigration is it's worth noting that that command to love your neighbor has no caveats. It doesn't say love your neighbor so long as it's completely safe. In fact, if you think about that story, the safe choice uh, on a road to Jericho, which scholars tell us had kind of a bad reputation, the sort of road you didn't want to be on late at night because people got beaten and robbed and were left to die, uh, the safe choice would not be to stop and linger there to help someone. The prudent decision from a human perspective would be to keep going, get out of the way, maybe make a phone call when you arrive at your destination, or whatever the equivalent was at that time, uh, but not to stop and put yourself at risk. And yet that's what the hero of the story, our model of neighborly love, does. And that reminds me of some of the churches that World Relief has partnered with over the years in the Middle East and certain parts of Africa, who are responding to really large numbers of displaced people who've recently come across a border, sometimes without undergoing much of any vetting in that process. And they're not always caring for people because they're confident that it's safe. Sometimes that they know that there's some risk involved. But frankly, they were never under the impression that following Jesus was going to be safe. And that is very challenging to me as an American. Because for Americans, safety is a very high cultural value. If you think about it, we end our emails with statements like, take care. Be safe, which are very nice sentiments, but not necessarily biblical commands. The biblical command is take courage, be not afraid. And not because we live in a great powerful country, though we do, but because of who our God is. Here's the irony in all of those concerns around safety. When we think about welcoming refugees or other immigrants to the United States, it's actually incredibly safe. It's a very different situation than uh, some of our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. So, for example, looking at refugees in particular, again, this is uh, individuals who've been invited by the United States government after being uh, determined overseas that they meet this legal definition. Uh, it's a very small share of the world's refugees who get selected for resettlement. Uh, in any time in the last 20 years, never more than one half of 1% of the world's refugees, and sometimes far less than that. And everyone who is invited first undergoes a very thorough vetting process. It's a vetting process that is actually the most thorough vetting that our country has for any category of visitor or immigrant who comes into the country. And it's been remarkably effective. Since the Refugee Act was signed into law by President Carter in 1980, 
there's been about three million refugees resettled to the United States, and not a single one has taken the life of an American citizen in a terrorist attack. That's actually a pretty good record, and we should, you know, our government doesn't do everything right, but that's something to affirm that they've uh, really done their job there. My concern is sometimes uh, in the church, we're so focused on the question of is the government doing their job to keep us safe, and maybe not looking very hard for the answers, that we've forgotten to ask the question of who is my neighbor? And to be the people, if it's a refugee family arriving at the Dayton Airport or the Columbus Airport, to be there to welcome them and help them to adjust to life in a new country. Now, it would be fair to say, okay, that's, you just said those are refugees who go through the most thorough vetting that our country has, but what about other immigrants? What in particular about an immigrant who basically crossed the border illegally, was never vetted at all, just kind of snuck into the country? Isn't that a concern? And to be clear, at World Relief, we've said for a long time, we do think that's a concern. We think that our country ought to have secure borders, uh, which is to say that we ought to know who's, our government ought to know who's coming into the country and should do everything reasonably possible to keep out anyone seeking to do harm. We think that is an appropriate function of government. What's not particularly fair is to presume that people who have come unlawfully, whether they cross the border unlawfully or maybe they overstayed a temporary visa, are disproportionately a threat to public safety. And I say that because we have quite a bit of data on that question, and the best data we have actually comes out of Texas. Um, the, Texas happens to be the only state out of 50 that tracks the immigration legal status of felony convictions. I know you may not be able to read the specific details of that graph, uh, but this is uh, all data from the state of Texas. The in thing that's notable is the blue category in that bar graph is my category. It's native-born U.S. citizens, people who were born in this country. The red category is lawfully present immigrants, people born abroad who came lawfully to the United States. I would include any refugee. And the green category is those who are unlawfully present in the country, someone who either crossed the border unlawfully or overstayed a temporary visa. And in each of these categories, and when you look at violent crime, property crime, drug violations, the U.S. citizens have the highest rate per capita of criminal convictions, followed by lawful pre present immigrants, followed by unlawfully present immigrants. Now, I don't share that with you so that you will be afraid of your U.S. citizen neighbors. Just to say that it is not particularly rational to be uniquely afraid of our immigrant neighbors. I'm also not suggesting that this is because immigrants are morally superior to U.S. citizens. That could be, but what's probably more likely is that immigrants have more to lose if they commit a crime. Because they, can't just, they don't just deal with the criminal justice system, they then deal with the immigration legal system and have a good likelihood of being deported. So there's more to lose and more disincentive towards criminal activity. Again, our call would be to love our neighbors even if there was some risk. But it's worth knowing that in terms of the U.S. context, the risk is actually very minimal when we talk about welcoming our refugee or other immigrant neighbors. But to mention those who've come unlawfully also brings up a whole other complicated question for Christians. Uh, we know that we want to love and welcome people, that's biblical, but we also want to follow the law. And there's biblical reasons for that too. Uh, probably the most prominent would be in Romans chapter 13, where the Apostle Paul says that everyone must be subject to the governing authorities. Uh, God, the Apostle Paul makes clear that God establishes government for a good purpose, to maintain order. Uh, and we're given this reason to respect the rule of law. So should we love and welcome immigrants, or should we follow the law? That's particularly a question when we think about the roughly 11 million or so immigrants who are not lawfully present in the country. But the answer, I'm pretty sure, is yes. We should love and welcome people, and we should follow the law. At least generally speaking, there's not a contradiction between those ideas. There's nothing in U.S. law or in the law in the state of Ohio that would say, if your next door neighbor is an immigrant and you think they might not be here legally, you need to report that. There's nothing in our laws that says that we can't, as a church, uh, you know, run an English class or teach someone Sunday school or let them teach Sunday school to you. As long as there's no compensation involved, that's where you get into a black and white legal issue, just in terms of employment. But in terms of just the sort of relationships that a citizen would have with their immigrant neighbors or that a church or organization would have in terms of ministering to people, there's not a legal contradiction there. Now, this is harder for our sisters and brothers in Christ who are unlawfully present. And there's a lot of those people in the church in the United States. Um, in fact, I go to a Spanish-speaking church outside of Chicago where I know that this affects people I worship with every week. And... I think what's important to know for Christians is most of those people are desperate to get right with the law. They've also read Romans 13, and they're not just casually disregarding laws. Uh, what was sort of surprising to me when I started working in immigration law years ago was that 
uh, most of those people are here unlawfully, not because they didn't fo follow the right process, but for most of them, there's a few exceptions, but for most of them, there wasn't a process for which they qualified. Real quickly, the ways you might immigrate lawfully to the country is having a close mem family member who's a US citizen or a lawful permanent resident. Uh, you could have an employer sponsor, but only if you are classified as highly skilled. Most of the time, is that gonna work out for you? So if you have like a master's degree, you could be fleeing persecution. You might be able to settle as a refugee or make your way to the US border or on a temporary visa and seek asylum. Frankly, that's part of why we're seeing such a huge number of, of Haitians showing up in the last several months, as well as Cubans and Venezuelans, uh, because it's sort of the last option available to you requires you to get to the border of the United States to seek asylum. Um, but if you're fleeing poverty, ultimately your asylum application is gonna be denied. You have to prove a credible fear of persecution. Or the last op opportunity is a diversity visa lo lottery, which is basically this online lottery. Your odds of winning are something like one in 400 most years, uh, but you can't enter that lottery if you are from Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, uh, Haiti, South Korea, any of the countries that send the most immigrants to the United States already. I go through all of that because it's really you know, easy to tell people, go wait your turn in line, but the reality is many of those people don't fit into any of those lines. If they manage to get here other than lawfully, they'll find a job almost immediately, especially in the current labor market, but they still will not qualify to adjust their status. Um, and they'll live often perpetually in that situation with a lot of fear that they might be sent back. Now what we've said at World Relief and uh, for many years is we don't think that an amnesty that just pretends that the law wasn't broken is the right solution. We don't think that honors the law the way that Romans 13 tells us to. But we also don't think it's either particularly humane or, or realistic to round up 11 million people and remove them from the country, especially when they have millions of US born children who under current law couldn't be deported. Uh, what we've said is a better way forward is to let those people come forward, acknowledge that they violated a law, pay a fine as a penalty for that violation of law, and then have the chance to earn permanent legal status over a number of years if they're willing to work for that or meet certain requirements paying a fine as, as restitution for their violation of law. We think that that both honors the law while also keeping families together and, and being compassionate. A Couple other points I wanna make before I close. One is that as we think about immigration as Christians, it's worth knowing that immigration is actually helping to revitalize the American church. In fact, the, the most recent book that I've, I've co-written with some friends is focused on how a lot of Americans are aware that Christianity in the United States is on a pretty significant decline. And that's true across various Christian traditions in the US. But one of the bright spots counteracting that decline is actually related to immigration. Most immigrants are coming from countries that by many measures are more Christian than the United States of the United States, the United States of America at this point. And many of them are bringing with them a very vibrant Christian faith. Um, in fact, some of them are immigrants, they're refugees because they were first Christians. The persecution that made them refugees was based on their faith in Jesus. Uh, the top country of origin for refugee resettlement in the last decade is Burma, also known as Myanmar, in Southeast Asia. And about 70% of those refugees are Christians of one sort or another. Lots of Baptists and Anglicans who were persecuted by the military government of Burma. Uh, when we welcome them, we welcome Jesus himself. Because in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And the disciples don't remember seeing Jesus hungry or thirsty or sick or in prison or a stranger, but he says, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it unto me. And as those people arrive in the country, bringing that vibrant Christian faith with them, they're often revitalizing churches and denominations that are very much in need of some revival. In fact, there's a, a quote from Tim Tennant, who's a president at Asbury Seminary. He says that 86 percent of the immigrant population in North America are likely to either be Christians or become Christians. That's far above the national average. The immigrant population actually presents the greatest hope for Christian renewal in North America. We shouldn't see this as something that threatens us. We should see this as a wonderful opportunity. The real other reality is when we turn our backs on resettling refugees as a nation, we say we won't take those people, uh, that affects persecuted Christians along with those of other religious backgrounds. So a couple of years ago, World Relief did a study with Open Doors USA looking at the number of Christian refugees resettled to the United States as, from the 50 countries where Open Doors says that Christians globally face the most severe persecution 
And the numbers went from about 18,500 in 2015. By 2020, they had declined by about 90%. Okay, that's just Christian refugees. If you looked at other refugee groups, the numbers would be similar. Uh, but it affected those fleeing because of their faith in significant numbers. Of course, the flip side to a lot of refugees and immigrants being Christians is a lot of other refugees and immigrants are not Christians. And if we're honest, I think that's where a lot of American Christians actually feel a little bit of tension around this question. If it was all Burmese Baptists, they might be okay with this. But what about Syrian Muslims or Afghan Muslims or Hindu refugees or those of other religious traditions? For some American Christians, that feels like a threat. Our view of World Relief is this is actually an incredible opportunity for the church. Uh, Jesus left us with this great commission to make disciples of all nations. And of course, we can and should do that by sending people to the nations with the message of the gospel. But we've missed something profound if we don't notice that God and his sovereignty has sent those nations to the United States. Uh, again, some of those people are already strong believers, but others will encounter the story of Jesus for the first time in this country. Uh, and to be really clear, at, at World Relief, we don't do proselytism where we serve people with some sort of expectation that they would change their faith. We don't trick people into following Jesus or pressure them. Uh, we don't believe in proselytism, but we do believe in evangelism rightly understood, which is an open invitation to a relationship with Jesus. And very often, that's going to happen in response to a question. When it's a team from a local church that welcomes a family at the airport and walks alongside them through those first several months of adjusting to life in a new culture, loving them as themselves, which we're called to do whether they would ever share their faith or not. When we do that part well, it's rare that sooner or later there's not the question of why. And we get to, as First Peter 3 says, to be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is within you, and to do so with gentleness and respect. Uh, J.D. Payne, who's a missiologist at Samford University, says that something is missionally malignant whenever we're willing to make great... Uh, I'm going to jump to the next slide. I'm going to forget this, the quote here. Something is missionally malignant whenever we're willing to make great sacrifices to travel the world to reach a people group but are not willing to walk across the street. So what do we do with all that? Real quickly, we've used this acronym of PLEASE. The first point there is prayer. Uh, praying for refugees and immigrants, praying for our churches here and around the world that we would know how to respond well, praying for governmental officials who make decisions that have profound impact on their well-being. Uh, the L is listening. Listening first and foremost to uh, the scriptures, but also listening to the stories of refugees and immigrants themselves. Uh, the E in that acronym is empowering churches abroad, uh, that most of the world's refugees are not coming to the United States. They're not going to Europe. They're actually in a country, neighboring the country that they fled. And often those are very poor countries with very limited resources. But that's one of the things that we do at World Relief is we come alongside local churches in Africa and Southeast Asia and in Haiti and other parts of the world and address both those who've had to be displaced from their homes but also the conditions that fuel displacement in the first place before it happens. The A in that acronym is advocacy. One definition of advocacy is to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. That's Proverbs uh, chapter 31, verse 8. Now, I just told you to listen to immigrant stories, so I don't want to characterize immigrants as people who cannot speak for themselves. But there is a sense in which often the, their voices are not heard in the same way as those of us who happen to have been born as U.S. citizens, especially by our elected officials who tend to think about re-election and therefore think about people who can vote, which excludes those who are not citizens, whether non-citizens in this country or stuck in a refugee camp halfway around the world. And I think with that comes an opportunity for, uh, for stewardship, to be a steward of this unique influence that God has given to those of us who happen to be U.S. citizens, uh, to advocate for the well-being not only of ourselves, but also for those who are vulnerable. The S in that acronym is serving locally. Uh, you have a really unique situation here in Springfield uh, in that you've rather suddenly had a very large number of, of immigrants, asylum seekers in many cases, from Haiti arriving. And one thing about asylum seekers in particular is once they win their asylum claim, they get most of the benefits that refugees do. Until then, they get very little, uh, if anything, from the government. They're basically on their own. They're not authorized to work in most cases until five months after they submit their asylum application, which usually means finding an, an immigration attorney, which could be hard to find in a, you know, outside of a major metropolitan area. So the odds are in many ways against them. But there are ways that churches can come alongside them and help them to adjust. Uh, the last point there is evangelism. Again, uh, as we advocate with people, as we serve them, we have the opportunity to point people to the hope of Jesus. 
And some people will share the gospel right back at you because many of them are already vibrant followers of Christ. But others will be encountering the story of the gospel for the first time as they land in this country. So in closing, I want to share this quote from Ronald Reagan, uh, President Reagan. This was actually his farewell address to the nation. I always found this a little bit inspiring. He says, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. In my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on the rocks, stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds, living in harmony and peace. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. Now, uh, I, I like that quote. It sort of roughly describes the sort of immigration policy that I would like to see the United States have personally. But I also need to quibble a little bit with President Reagan. Uh, he cites that phrase, a shining city upon a hill, to the early Puritan colonist John Winthrop, which is accurate. Winthrop used that phrase to describe the United States. But, of course, that's not the origins of, of that phrase. If any of you know your Bibles, you know that that idea of a city on a hill comes from Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. And very importantly, Jesus was not talking to the United States of America. Uh, he wasn't talking to any nation state. He was talking to his disciples, to the church in its earliest form. And he said this, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Sisters and brothers, there are tens of millions of people around our world today who've been displaced from their homes, a few of whom will end up in Springfield, Ohio, uh, most of whom will never come to this country, many of whom are brothers and sisters in Christ, but many of others whom are not, and many of them, their only awareness of what it is, who it is that Jesus is will be the reaction of people who profess to follow Jesus to the greatest refugee crisis in recorded history. Whether that response from the church is marked by love and hospitality and advocacy or by apathy or even fear and hostility. And my prayer is that the response of churches in Ohio and across the United States and across Europe and Africa and Latin America and all over the world would so reflect the love of God for vulnerable people that they would see our good works and give glory to our Father who's in heaven. Amen. Father, we thank you for your love. Father, we thank you that when we were strangers, um, you adopted us into your family and made us your children. And Father, I, I pray that we would always be aware of the grace that we have received. I pray that we would always be aware of the ways that we have benefited from your mercy. And I pray that you would help us to be channels of your loving kindness to others uh, wherever we find people who are in need uh, of a touch of your grace and love. Father, we thank you uh, for the chance we've had to learn. We thank you for the reminders of passages that help us to think through uh, difficult topics like this. And we pray that your spirit would move in our community in ways that honor and bless you and advance the kingdom of heaven. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let me read a benediction as we close. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Mm -hmm.